All right, so tonight I want to uh, teach about the Old Testament blessing and cursing, uh, the blessing and cursing in the Old Testament, and um, just touch on a few points on how I believe today it's, um, it's been misapplied in a lot of um, Bible-believing churches that we know about. Um, so I wanted to go through it and just uh, explain to you what I believe, what I believe is the right interpretation of it, because obviously the Pentecostals have a wrong interpretation of it, and then a lot of Bible-believing churches misapply it, I, I think, as well. Uh, thinking that it still applies in the New Testament today. Um, so uh, it's going to be a sermon about uh, the Old Testament blessing and cursing and what is sort of the New Testament equivalent, quote-unquote, of it. Uh, but I'll touch on that a bit later. So let's start in Deuteronomy 11. We'll just verse, read verse 26 to uh, 29. It says, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. Is there a bit of feedback, Mike? You hear feedback? You're okay. I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. If it sounds all right, then it's okay. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. And a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which you have not known. Um, and it shall come to pass when the Lord thy God hath brought thee in unto the land whither thou goest to possess it, that thou shalt put the blessing upon Mount Ger Gerizim and the curse upon Mount Ebal. So let's go to Joshua. I'll just show you a couple of other verses. Joshua uh, 8.30. <clears throat> just to show that there is a blessing and a curse that is associated with the law of Moses. So when um, Moses, gave, Moses got the law from God and he delivered the commandments, there was a blessing and a curse associated, meaning, you know, we just read that in Deuteronomy 11, that if you were to obey the law, you would be blessed. If you were to disobey the law, you would be cursed. And I just want to show you here that the law of Moses has that link with the blessing and cursing in uh, uh, Joshua 8.30 here. Uh, then Joshua built an altar unto the Lord God of Israel on Mount Ebal, uh, so we read about that just before. As Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded the children of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of whole stones over which no man hath lift up any iron. <coughs> and they offered thereon burnt offerings unto the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. And he wrote there upon the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he wrote in the presence of the children of Israel. Now, I remember the first time I read that, I thought that he actually like, was chiseling it into the stone. But then I was thinking that would have taken a long time for him to write the whole book, chiseling it into rock. But I, I believe what it's saying is that he's just you know, on the altar writing a book, right? And, but, he, but he actually writes out a copy of the whole you know, law of Moses in the presence of the people. So I don't know how long that took. You, know, you can imagine them all standing around in the presence. I don't know if they're just standing there the whole time or he's just in the midst of them. I'm not sure. Because it would have taken him a long time to, to write um, the whole book of the law of Moses, <coughs> uh, which he wrote in the presence of the children of Israel. And all Israel and their elders and officers and their judges stood on this side of the ark and on that side before the priests, the Levites, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, as well the stranger as he that was born among them, half of them over against Mount Gerizim, and half of them over against Mount Ebal, as Moses the servant of the Lord had commanded before, that they should bless the people of Israel. And afterward he read all the words of the law, the blessings and cursings, according to all that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses commanded, which Joshua read not, before all the congregation of Israel, with the women, and the little ones and the strangers that were conversant among them. So if you remember, I turned to that verse when I was talking about um, the appropriateness of teaching the Bible to children. And um, it's interesting here that everybody was present. It wasn't just the men of Israel. It, was, it even mentions that the women and the children and even the, the strangers that, that were able, I guess, to speak Hebrew amongst them. He read the whole book of Moses to them. Um, and if you can think about all the themes that the book of Moses touches on, there's a lot of things that we would deem as not child appropriate. And yet here we have an example here where they don't hide anything from the word of God from children, because if it's in the word of God, it's profitable, right? For doctrine, not just for the old, but also for the young, not just for males, but also for females. Um, so we see there that link between the blessings and the cursings and, and the law of Moses. Let's go to Deuteronomy 27. Um, verse 11. And we'll start to read uh, these blessings and cursings that uh, are associated with the commandments given in the, given in the law of Moses. 
<clears throat> so this is Deuteronomy 27. It says, And Moses charged the people the same day, saying, These shall stand upon Mount Gerizim to bless the people when ye are come over Jordan, uh, Simeon and Levi and Judah and Issachar and Joseph and Benjamin. So there's six tribes on one mountain. And these shall stand upon Mount Ebal to curse Reuben, Gad and Asher and Zebulun and Dan <clears throat> and Naphtali. <coughs> Oh, it was Levi here. Okay, Levi's there. So, so Levi, if you remember, didn't get a, a portion of inheritance. And then it was Joseph that got split into Ephraim and Manasseh got the double portion. Uh, verse 14. And the Levites shall speak and say unto all the men of Israel with a loud voice, Cursed be the man that maketh any graven or molten image an abomination unto the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsmen, and putteth it in a secret place, and all the people shall answer and say, Amen. Cursed be he that setteth light by his father or his mother, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that removeth his neighbor's landmark, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that maketh the blind to wander out of the way, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that perverteth the judgment of the stranger, fatherless and widow, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that lieth with his father's wife, because he uncovereth his father's skirt, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that lieth with any manner of beast, and all the people shall say, Amen. <coughs> Cursed be he that lieth with his sister, the daughter of his father, or the daughter of his mother, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that lieth with his mother-in-law, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that smiteth his neighbour secretly, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that taketh reward to slay an innocent person, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them, and all the people shall say, Amen. So I wanted you to take note just of verse 26, but we'll come back to that later. Let's look at some of the, uh, the uh, blessings in uh, the next chapter over. And, and, you know, if you read from Deuteronomy 27 all the way to Deuteronomy 30, it goes into it in a lot more depth. I'm just giving you a bit of a snapshot. Deuteronomy 28, it shall come to pass if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and do all his commandments. So just take note of that, which I command thee this day that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. <coughs> Blessed shalt thou be in the city. Blessed shalt thou be in the field. So we can see... Um, uh, what, what God is blessing here if um, people uh, would have obeyed the Old Testament commandments. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy ground and the fruit of thy cattle and the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses and in all that thou settest thine hand unto and he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. So that's like, you know, blessing their businesses and their farms and everything they're doing. The Lord shall establish thee and holy people unto himself as he hath sworn unto thee. Thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways. And all people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord and they shall be afraid of thee. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, in the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy ground, in the land which the Lord sware unto thy fathers to give thee. The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven, to give the rain unto thy land in his season, and to bless all the work of thine hand. And thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. And the Lord shall make thee the head, and not the tail, and thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath. If thou hearken, if that thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day, to observe and to do them. <clears throat> and, uh, and thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day, to the right hand or to the left, to go after other gods to serve them. So we, we see here that's what the blessing and the cursing is in the Old Testament. So to, to, just to give you a snapshot, so it's just basically saying you need to keep all the commandments. If you keep all the commandments, you're blessed. If you don't keep all the commandments, then you're cursed. And even we read in Deuteronomy 27, uh, that last verse, uh, and we see, we'll see that quoted later again in uh, Galatians 3, where it, it makes the point here. Um, oh, did I skip past it? 27. 
here. Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them, and all the people shall say, Amen. And even in verse 1 of verse 28, when it goes on to the blessings, it says, If thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day. So this is not a grey line, this blessing and cursing. This blessing and cursing is you either keep all the commandments and you're blessed, or you, or you haven't kept them all, which is all of us, right? Because we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, and you are cursed. Now, the way the way the the, the prosperity preachers, like you know, like Joel Osteen, and um, I don't know who, I don't listen to them. I only know Joel Osteen because Stephen Anderson talks about him all the time. But um, uh, I don't know who all, all these prosperity preachers are, right? Um, but the way they misinterpret the blessing and cursing, right? Because in in the New Testament, it's it's true that we are blessed by faith but they're misapplying it in terms of getting a physical blessing, right? And they say, well, if you're a Christian, then you're going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise, and, you know, you're going to have no trouble, you know, you're going to be, you're going to be rich and handsome, and, you know, get any lady you want, or I don't know what they're saying. But that's the whole idea of this prosperity gospel, is that you, if you are saved, if you're a child of God, then child, uh, the God's going to bless you with all these things in the Old Testament. And then they go to the, the blessings in the Old Testament and say, hey, look, because we are blessed by faith and therefore we get all these, um, you know, physical blessings. You know, you have children, you have the fruit of your storehouses will be full, your business will be going well, you know, you'll have good health, you won't have any problems. But um, anybody that's got a brain, anybody that's got rationality, I mean, they will look at the world and you say, well, then why are all these believers got it so hard? Why all these believers have health problems? Why all these old believers have financial problems? Like, uh, you know, you don't have to look very far. I mean, you can just even read in the Bible. And if the prosperity gospel was true, why was Jesus poor? Why were all the disciples getting tortured and, you know, didn't have anywhere to sleep and things like that? Where was their prosperity? Where were their blessings of having all this stuff? Because that's not how it works uh, in the New Testament. Uh, we'll talk about that a bit later. So that's how prosperity preachers like Joel Osteen will take these verses out of context. They'll take them and not apply the whole scriptures and, and apply them the right way in how they're taught in the New Testament. But what we see um, <clears throat> being applied by some Bible-believing churches is that they think that this still applies to us in the New Testament in the form that we see here. In the sense that you are only blessed by God if you obey, and if you don't obey, you're going to be under the curse of God. Now, if you take that position, there's going to be only two conclusions you can come to, right? Either one is, um, uh, where do I have this? Uh, or do I have that later? Those that believe the Old Testament blessing cursing, uh, they're not consistent. Oh, uh, right, because they, um, uh, where is it? Oh, here we go, here it is. I'm jumping around in my notes, I've sort of gone off. See, that's what happens when you don't follow your notes and you skip a bunch of things. So you'll either come to two conclusions, right, if you have this position. One is it'll make you give up, right, because you'll never be good enough, right? Because if you have the position that I have to obey God in, and I have to obey all his commandments in order to be blessed, then the next logical question is, well, then who is blessed? Because nobody keeps all his commandments, right? So you either come to the position where you think, well, I, I, it's not even possible. It's not even possible for me to be blessed. And you're just constantly believing that you're under the curse of God, that God has forsaken you, and you read through all these curses and you just think, that's me. You either come to that conclusion or you come to the conclusion that you're either, what I believe, like you're deluded, like you've deceived yourself, or you're a hypocrite to think that you actually have kept all the commandments to claim that you are under the blessing of God. Because it's, it's a bit like salvation. Because what people that take the position that you have to, you know, the blessing and cursing still applies today, they might go to a passage like this. And I'll just get back onto my uh, thing here. Uh, Malachi 3. Let's go to verse 8. So this is, this is a, the, a very popular passage where they'll go to to talk about the curse. And uh, it's in Malachi 3. Eh? They'll say, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. And that's, that's another topic. I won't go into tithes and offerings today. Uh, it says here, ye are cursed with a curse. 
For ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now where, herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. So this is just one example. I'm not, I'm not you, I don't, uh, my personal opinion is I don't think tithes are part of the New Testament. There's a different model now. But a lot of Bible-believing churches still do believe the tithe is part of the New Testament. And then they will turn to a verse like this and they'll say, see, if you don't tithe, then you're under the curse. But then it's, it's not consistent because the blessing and cursing in the Old Testament is not, hey, if you tithe, therefore you'll be blessed. No, it's you have to keep all the commandments to be blessed. And if you don't keep all the commandments then you're cursed. So, but they'll use verses like that to sort of, uh, you know, get people to believe that there is a curse still around. Um, and uh, disobedience is sort of discouraged by the threat of this cursing as opposed to other means that I believe are more biblical in the New Testament. Uh, so, if that position is right, if the blessing and cursing is still applicable for today, then, see, remember with the prosperity preacher, they can't answer the question of why then do believers have it so hard. But if you believe that blessing and cursing is still happening today, and um, if people are, uh, I guess, uh, um, what's the word, like, cursed because they disobey, then the question you can't answer is why are there so many unbelieving, ungodly people that seem to be so blessed. Do you see what I mean? So the prosperity preacher has the problem where it's like, well, you've got all these believers that have it so hard. But then the people that are saying, well, if, you're, if you disobey, you're cursed of God, and yet they're deluded to the point where they're thinking they're under the blessing of God because they think they keep all the commandments. But then why are there people that are supposedly um, un have not, don't want anything to do with God? They, they, they hate God. They're unbelievers. And yet... They seem to you know, have children, their businesses are doing well, they're doing fine. Why aren't, why aren't they under the curse of God? Like um, this is saying. And the other question is, and I sort of touched on this, how obedient do you need to be before you're blessed? And I've sort of already touched on that because you can see in Deuteronomy 28 and Deuteronomy 27 that it's not a grey line. It's not like if you're, you know, because we think in, in our sort of church, and, and, and people that uh, maybe believe like we do, we think just because we go soul winning, we read the Bible, we're in church, hey man, we're right with God. We, we, we have earned the blessing of God. But is, is that all it takes to earn the blessing of God? No, you have to keep every single command. That means you don't sin at all, ever. Because once you've sinned, you haven't kept all the commandments, you're under the curse. So you see how somebody who believes that the Old Testament blessing and cursing is still applicable today and yet still believes that they are under the blessing of God, they are, they've deluded themselves. And that's why people that are honest with themselves struggle with this doctrine if they accept it because you just realize you just cannot measure up. You can't measure up to all the commandments and you're just constantly under the curse. And this is a problem. This is going to affect your spiritual life because you don't believe, you'll start to think that God doesn't love you anymore. Right? Because the curse is for people that God hates. The curse is for unbelievers. The curse is for people that God has forsaken, he's destroyed. You know, and if you believe you're under the curse, what are you going to start thinking about God? What is your relationship going to be like with God? And how are you going to be a witness to the love and grace of God if you don't even believe you've got it? Because trying to earn the blessing by works, it's just like salvation in the sense that you can't, you can't earn salvation by works. I'll just turn to one verse. This is Galatians 2.16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And we all know Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Nobody is perfect. Nobody has kept all the commandments. So just like salvation, I mean, if somebody was to say to you that they believe salvation is by keeping all the commandments, are they not deluded if they think that they're saved? Right? It's like somebody that says you've got to return from all your sins, repent of all your sins, and yet they claim to be saved. And you're just thinking like you either, 
if you believe salvation is by works, you'll either be in a state of hopelessness where you'll never ever get there because you realize how far you come short of the glory of God, if you're honest with yourself, or you've deceived yourself into thinking that you have done all the works and that somehow you can claim to be saved. Well, trying to get the blessing of God by works is no different because the Bible says you need to keep all the commandments in order to be blessed by God. So it's, it's no different. If, if you can't get salvation by works, if salvation were by works, who can be saved? Remember, Jesus said, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. So if, 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 if blessings, if the blessing of the Old Testament blessing of God is by works, uh, who can be blessed? You know, we would, we would all be cursed. Um, because being blessed by the works of the law would require perfection. Um, and, you know, just like attaining salvation by works leaves you feeling hopeless, you know, likewise attaining God's blessings by works would leave you feeling hopeless as well. And that's why I'm saying you either come to two conclusions. If you accept the doctrine that you are blessed if you obey and you are cursed if you disobey, you will come to a position in your Christian life where you either think, what's the point? You know, and you give up because you'll never measure up or you've just deceived yourself into thinking that you are good enough to deserve those blessings uh, by those works that we do, which in the eyes of God are not much at all. You know, maybe if you compare yourself to somebody else, you might be able to put yourself on this pedestal, but if you put yourself next to Jesus, how would you fare? You know? So let's go to Galatians 3. We get, a, we get an explanation in Galatians 3 of uh, how to apply the Old Testament blessing and cursing in the New Testament. How does it work? So in Galatians 3, it says here, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. So he's saying here, how were you saved? Were you saved by the Spirit, by grace, through faith, or were you saved by works? Now, obviously, it's a rhetorical question there, right? It's, it's by faith. He says, then he says, Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? So isn't that the same thing where somebody believes, hey, they are not good enough to get saved, yet they can be good enough to earn the blessing of God, even though it's the same standard. Do you know what I mean? So are you made, are you made uh, you're having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, uh, unto Abraham saying, <coughs> In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. So you see, that's the blessing that was given to Abraham. And it's interesting there that when God said to Abraham, in thee shall all nations be blessed, that was actually preaching a foreshadowing of the gospel. For as many as are of the works of the law. So you see, if we try and be blessed by the works of the law, look what it says, for as many are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So you see, if you try and get the blessing by works, you don't. That's why by, by, if we're of the law, if we're of the works of the law, we're all cursed, right? Because, and this is a quote of Deut the last verse in Deuteronomy 27, if you remember. Uh, let's go there, Deuteronomy 27. I think it was verse 26 or something. 26. Galatians 3 is quoting this passage. Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them, and all the people shall say, Amen. What did it say in <coughs> Galatians 3? For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So you see how we are not blessed by works right we are not blessed we don't receive the blessing in the old testament by the works of the law we get it by the by the hearing of faith 
but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So you see, there was a blessing and a cursing in, in the Old Testament, but if we try and get there by works, which is which is talking about salvation, right? If we try and do it by works, we, we're not going to make it. We come short of the glory of God. There, and, and we are under the curse. But the reason why we, are not, we don't receive the curse is because Jesus Christ was made a curse for us. He took our punishment for us. That's what it is. He took the curse for us. And then what is left? The, what is left for us if the, is the blessing and the blessing that was given to Abraham and we receive that by faith. So you can't be blessed if you're of the law because we have all sinned. The curse is damnation, that Christ is the damnation that Christ became for us. The blessing is salvation by faith, the gospel that was preached to Abraham. And if we go to Deuteronomy 30, I'll just show you here. We can actually see that this is alluded to um, in, in Deuteronomy 30 uh, when it talks about you know, the blessing and the cursing. So if you, if you read, you can go back and read it yourself later, but Deuteronomy 27, you remember, we started there, there was the curses. Before he went through the laws, you know, again in Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy 11, they said, I set before you a blessing and a curse. And then it goes through a bunch more laws. That's kind of a, a, a repeat of uh, Exodus, <coughs> as well as some others. Then you get to Deuteronomy 27, where there's the blessing and the cursing on the two mountains. And then we come to Deuteronomy 30, where, as we read it, it talks about, you know, when once God has scattered them, you know, he's, he's cursed them, basically, because they didn't keep the commandment. He scattered them. Then they'll remember, they'll turn back to the Lord, and then he'll bring them back together. And we see here, um, we'll, we'll read it, and then we'll talk about it a bit. Verse, uh, verse 1. And it shall come to pass, when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations, whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee, and shalt return unto the Lord thy God, and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thine heart and with all thy soul, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity, and have compassion upon thee, and will return and gather thee from all the nations, whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. If any of thine be driven out unto the outmost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. So it's interesting that he's like even gathering people all over. What does that sound like, right? It's like, that's like the, the end times when we're all gathered together. <clears throat> and the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. So isn't that interesting that... Even in Deuteronomy 30, when he's talking about gathering them together again and they're turning back to the Lord, that there's a circumcision of the heart. And what is that? It's in the New Testament, right? That's the real circumcision in Romans 2 is circumcision of the heart and not of the, not of the flesh. To love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. So what I'm sort of getting you to think about here is as we read through Deuteronomy 30, this is actually a prophetical passage about new, the believers, that one day, you know, that believers will get that blessing, they'll be brought back to a land, their heart will be circumcised, and then they'll keep all the commandments because we'll be, we'll be sinless. So I don't believe this is talking about when God brought Israel back because Israel, Israel when, they, when they came back and they returned with Nehemiah and, and Ezra, they were still sinners. Do you know what I mean? They didn't keep all the commandments. But the reason why I think God did it, even though in the Bible we read that, you know, that they turned to the Lord, it's because he still, I believe, did it by grace. Just like Noah, he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. They called unto the Lord, they found grace. And the reason why I think he brought them back um, and allowed them to set back up in Jerusalem is just a shadow of things to come. You know, that one day we will be gathered, the real gathering will be going back, you know, all of us as believers. But I think that's why it's in there, right? It's written for, for our example. We can see, oh, you know, they cried unto the Lord. They were brought back and, and that sort of thing. Uh, verse 7, The Lord thy God will put all these curses upon thine enemies and on them that hate thee, which persecuted thee. So you see there that the believers are coming back. They have circumcised hearts. 
and the cursing is on those that don't believe, the enemies of God, <laughs> and on them that hate thee, which persecuted thee, and thou shalt return and obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments, which I command thee this day. So, you know, Israel didn't do that. <coughs> and the Lord thy God will make thee plenteous in every work of thine hand, and in the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy cattle, and the fruit of thy land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over thee for good, as he rejoiced over thy fathers. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the law, and if thou turn unto the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul. Uh, this is an interesting part. This, this is, uh, this, if, as I read this, this may sound familiar to you. For this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very nigh unto thee, in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. And um, I'll come back to that in a second. Verse 15, See, I have set before thee this day life and good, and death and evil, in that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart... So he's going again into, hey, keep the commandments, so you, you, you can be blessed, disobey, you curse. But if thy heart turn away so that thou wilt not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land whither thou passest over Jordan to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. So again, alluding to the Old Testament blessing and cursing. So I think what this is alluding to is the salvation. Like I said, you know, he's going to gather everyone even if they're out utmost part of heaven. You know, is that talking about Israel, physical Israel? No. When they, when they went back in the days of Nehemiah and Ezra? No. Like he's, he's talking about gathering everyone and they're going to be perfect and they're going to keep the commandments. That's talking about when we are resurrected, we are sinless and we're going to be back, you know, in the millennial kingdom, ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ in this new nation um, that is established. Now, what is interesting, how does that work with believers turning back to the Lord? Well, this is what's interesting about this passage. If, if, when we read from Deuteronomy 11 to about uh, verse 13, now it sounded familiar, didn't it? Why? Because this is actually alluded to in Romans 10. And if you know Romans 10, this is a very crucial passage to salvation, talking about the righteousness, which is not of works, but of faith. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. So you see, people are still trying to obtain their own righteousness by the works of the law. But, verse 4, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. So this is why I think we can you link Deuteronomy 30 in the sense that, hey, one day there will be a turning back to the Lord, because the turning back to the Lord and the keeping the commandments is the righteousness by faith. Once you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that is the end of the law for righteousness. Once we believe on Jesus Christ, we are, that is the turning back um, in righteousness in order to get that blessing that is talked about in Deuteronomy 30. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. So he's basically saying, if you are trying to get life, which remember in Deuteronomy 30, choose life or death. If you're trying to get life by the law, that's not going to happen because you've got to keep, you're going to have to live by the law. Meaning, like Paul said in Galatians 5, you're a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you are justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thy heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. So you see how this is reading like Deuteronomy 11. What's interesting about that is that there was the, the law given to give life 
and both of them are with you kind of thing it's it's kind of like you don't have to go and and find the laws in order to find life he's saying that there was a law a blessing and a cursing you don't have to go to heaven to find it or in hell to get or across the sea or whatever it's with you but remember in deuteronomy 30 it said it's in your mouth and in your heart so that you'll do it but he says but the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise so he's saying hey this is now the righteousness which is of faith and it's like the same thing say not in thy heart who shall ascend into heaven because he's saying that is to bring christ down from above right so we're not going to take christ down again after he's ascended or who shall descend into the deep that is to bring up christ again from the dead but what saith it <coughs> i think that's, that's that's interesting that he says that is to bring christ down from above because he's he's acknowledging that christ is above right now but then he says that is to bring up christ again from the dead because christ has already risen from the dead but what saith it the word is nigh thee even in thy mouth and in thy heart that is the word of faith which we preach so it see at this time the word that is in your mouth and in your heart is not that you'll do it because that's not how you get the blessing now it's in your mouth and in your heart it's the word of faith which we preach why so that you'll believe it because it says here that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the lord jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So isn't that, that interesting that there's that the two covenants, right? There's the blessing and the cursing, which is the works of the law, and then there's the hearing of faith, which is how it's in the New Testament. And yet God is saying that they're not they're, they're not secret. They're not away from you. They're in their, your mouth, in your heart just like the old testament blessing and cursing was there that they could do it the new testament um believing on the lord jesus christ is there as well um, i just think that's interesting that that those two scriptures link those two passages together the old and the new saying you don't have to go anywhere to find it it's there it's out in the open you just have to believe it just like in the old testament you just had to do it but that was impossible uh, so i think that's interesting and 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 this also explains the turning back to God and the righteousness that we obtain by believing on Jesus Christ, the imputed righteousness, even Romans 4 explains. Um, we won't impute sin, but we have righteousness imputed unto us. So I hope that gives you a good idea of how that works. So just like sort of a, a, just, a, just a summary. So in the Old Testament, there was a blessing and a cursing under the law, but it can't be kept. God still dealt with Israel by grace at times, I think as a shadow of things to come. And that's why even though they were sinners, you know, the, the Old Testament still makes statements like their heart was right with the Lord and things like that. Because they're, it, even though in the Old Testament, uh, you know, they were living under the law and, you know, the Old Covenant was in effect. But at the same time, we read the Psalms and we still see God's grace throughout the Old Testament. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Abraham believed God. It was imputed unto him for righteousness because God still dealt with them according to grace. Because if God dealt with them according to the law, they, none of, none of, they would have received nothing from God. They would have all been cursed. So you see, like when you read through the Old Testament, you're seeing sort of both. You're seeing shadows of the New Testament as well as God dealing with them according to the Old Testament. That's why he scattered them. So there's a bit of both as you read through the Old Testament. And that's why the Old Testament needs to be interpreted using the New Testament scriptures. Um, so in the New Testament, you know, now that we're under, under grace, the blessing is by faith in Jesus Christ who was made a curse for us and we turn to the Lord by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, having the righteousness which is by faith. And one day, <coughs> that blessing and curse will be fulfilled as talked about in Deuteronomy 30 when we will be gathered and then we'll be in a land and we will get that blessing, you know, and, and you know, it, it'll be a spiritual blessing. I'm not sure how that's going to work out because obviously it talks about, you know, having children and things like that. So I'm not sure you know what that means or it's talking about the fact that we are spiritually blessed because those who are saved take part in creating spiritual children by believing on the lord jesus christ so until then so until that time so how do we then explain the good and bad things that happen to people if it's not based on obedience right because that's how a lot of people that take the position that blessing and cursing is why bad things happen to you and then you either think you either come to the point where oh, is my life just so messed up because i'm just so sinful 
and yet there are more sinful people than me and their life is not that messed up and sitting in that sort of position where you're a bit confused and thinking well, why why I'm, I'm at least saved i'm in church but why is god hating me so much that my life is so messed up and yet these people that hate god don't go to church don't want anything to do with god they're not having the same problems i have you start to get that job's friend mentality that god is treating you this way because he's angry with you you've done something wrong that's worse than somebody else as opposed to um what we learn in the new testament which is no it's not the curse christ took the curse from us there is no curse anymore there's only the blessing so then why then in the day we live in does do bad things happen to us what what are some explanations there's not just one silver bullet but a couple of things for you to think about let's go to um, galatians 6 verse 7 this is one one is just the natural law of sowing and reaping right be not deceived god is not mocked for whatsoever man soweth that shall he also reap for he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption but he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting and let us not be weary in well-doing for in due season we shall reap if we faint not so this idea of sowing and reaping and it's saying here in verse 9 that if you just continue to, to work at it you're not necessarily always just being blessed because you're you know you're you're, you're being blessed of god because of the blessing and cursing because you'd never get it by works but it's just that because the curse is no longer there you just only have upside potential now in the sense that you know you can work and work and work and the, the more you work the more work you put in the more you're going to reap so in terms of the physical world you know sometimes when it comes to money people just have money because they work harder you know they put in more hours they're more dedicated maybe they have more wisdom than other people do it's not just because they're being blessed by god because they're obedient because that doesn't even make sense according to, to the deuteronomy passages because they're not keeping all the commandments so that can't be the source of their blessing so they it could just be a, a factor of sowing and reaping you know if you work hard the more hours you put in the harder you work the more uh skills that you acquire the more uh education you get you're going to be more valuable you can make more money you might have an idea uh you know i've been watching episodes of shark tank because i just think it's really interesting they come in and pitch all these crazy ideas and things like that but um i just think it's really interesting that these people come up with these all these ideas and it's like you know they, they and you you see as they come in they, they're hard workers they're people that are putting in way more hours than probably all of us are and and anybody that's in a financially successful position they know that they had to work to get there you know so that's one reason why people do well financially it's just hard work you know why are people healthy well it's because they take care of their body they think about what they put in their body they exercise they they don't just not care about things and then you know 20 years later why have they got back problems knee problems this problem oh, am i cursed by god is it a cursing of god or you just didn't think about it when you were 20 and 30 you didn't think about it catching up on you you know and and now it's it's hard to make up for the damage that has been done for your body and now you're starting to feel the effects um so this is one reason i'm not saying this is the only reason right? it's not the only reason there are many reasons why you know bad things happen and sometimes it is god you know sometimes it's our own doing sometimes it's just the sinful world that we live in that's not perfect we have degenerative dna and whatnot even if you're trying to do everything right but this is one reason one reason is you just reap what you sow and it's the same with sin you know people that take drugs they get addicted right um, even uh, Romans 6 alludes to this. We'll just read a couple of passages there. It says, uh, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then shall we sin? Oh, what then? Shall we sin? Because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not. So he's saying, you know, just because there's no curse, does that mean that we continue to sin? No. He says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves <coughs> servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness so this is sort of tied into reaping and sowing in the sense that if the more sin you do the more easy it's going to be to sin and it's the same with like drugs it's like an addiction you know if you're doing drugs it's harder to get off drugs you know the more you smoke the harder it is to get off smoking um things like that you know it's just you're just reaping what you're sowing if you don't exercise it's going to be hard to, to get on exercise or um you know if you if you're committing fornication you know then it's going to be hard to get off it you know and this is uh, my wife and i were, were talking about this not long ago in the sense that you know people who give up their virginity 
generally don't care so much the second time around. Why? Because they've, they've already done it, right? It's easy. It's not so precious anymore. It's, um, but generally the first time is where people are hesitant. But once they fornicate, then, you know, they've sort of taken off those limits and then they go and fornicate because it's not, it's not that big a deal anymore because you become a servant to sin as well in the sense that you now know what it feels like. Just like when you take a drug, you know what it feels like and you now crave that feeling. So sin ruins people, whether it's fornication, addiction, or, you know, whether it's like, uh, like a criminal punishment. You know, like, can somebody think, like, well, you know, they, they committed a crime or they committed a murder and now it's hard for them to get a job or something like that, or now they're incarcerated. I, is it God that's cursing them? No, it's just they're, they're just reaping and sowing what they've done. Um, now, I'll end on this point. And, and like I said, sowing and reaping is not the only reason why people uh, experience negative things in their life. There are other reasons. Um, it could be, uh, could be Satan. You know, Satan could be doing something or the devils could be doing something. It could be spiritual attack. could be, um, you know, like I said, just this sinful world where you know, no matter how healthy you try and be, you, know, you, you get cancer anyway or you get something anyway, even though you've tried so hard to be healthy. I know people that have you know, done their best, you know, been healthy, watched what they ate, and you know, maybe they just had a, a predisposition genetically to, to not be able to fight off a certain disease or whatnot. Um, but in terms of when it comes to God, <coughs> if there's no blessing and cursing, if we are blessed no matter how we live, then what differentiates a believer who is striving to live right and one who isn't, right? Because if we're just blessed anyway, whether we keep the commandments or no, then in the New Testament, what is the differentiator? What is the new sort of blessing and cursing? And what it is, it's rewards and chastisement, right? Rewards and chastisement. So in 1 Corinthians 3, we read about the rewards. It says here, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So that's salvation, right? We have, we have Christ. He's the rock that we then can build this house upon. <coughs> now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, so this is the work that you do in your life, right? What are you going to build on this foundation? Are you going to build things out of gold, silver, and precious stones? Or wood, hay, and stubble? What's the difference? Every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work, what sort it is. So one day we're going to be judged, not by our sins, but by the works of the law, but by what we have done for Jesus Christ. Have we built upon this foundation gold, silver, and precious stones? Or have we built wood, hay, and stubble? Meaning, is it things that are going to abide the fire? Are they eternal? Do they have eternal value? You know, you work for a car. That's, that's wood, hay, and stubble. A house, wood, hay, and stubble. Businesses, wood, hay, and stubble. And these are necessary. There's, there's ne there might be a necessary bit of wood, hay, and stubble on this house in order to just get things going, right? But what's the majority of it? When it's tried by fire, is it all going to be gone? You know, I want, to, I want to use a bit of wood, hay, and stubble there. But when the fire comes, I want it to be mainly gold, silver, and precious stones because that's all that, that's going to matter in eternity. So you want to think about how you spend your time and reflect on what you do with your resources, whether it's time and money, your days, whatnot. It's really only time and money. Well, time and money, that's, pr that's pretty much it, right? Because money represents all your material possessions. And then you've got the, your time in the day. What are you doing with it? You know, are you building gold, silver, and precious stones? Or are you going to get to the judgment seat of, you know, this judgment day and the fire is going to try your work and it's just going to all be burnt away and you're just going to think, what did I do with my life? What a waste. You might be having fun now. You might be enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season, serving yourself, but you'll regret it when you get to the judgment. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. So you see, that's, a, that's the incentive to do right. You don't, you don't do right so that you're not cursed because you'll never get there if you actually think about it, right? In terms of how do you receive the blessing? You'll never get it. But what is, I guess, the new blessing in the New Testament? What is going to encourage you to, to work for God and spend time and resources serving God is that there's going to be a reward. Not going to heaven, but additional rewards on top of that because everyone already has that foundation of Jesus Christ if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. 
If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So you're not going to lose your salvation. You can't lose salvation. It's, it's everlasting life. You know, Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Once you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, free gift. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you have everlasting life. Even at this judgment, you don't lose everlasting life. Right? He himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Why? Because your works as a Christian are going to be tried. And if all you've built on that foundation is wood, hay and stubble, then you're going to look at it and, and it's just all going to be gone. And then think about that. When you, if you build a business, right? you spend all this time and then it just like collapses overnight. That's what it's going to be like as a Christian. Like we all have like this business that we are in charge of right? for God. And what are we going to build this business out of? Are we going to get to this and it's just going to collapse overnight? Or are we going to build something that lasts and has eternal value? So that's rewards. So you think about this, building the foundation, what's less going to be the rewards. You think about the parable, the pounds and the talents. I'm not going to go there, but you remember the servants come, they're given a certain amount of pounds and talents, and then they report back what they have done with those things, and they are rewarded accordingly. And we see the pounds and the talents showing that there are things where everyone's given equal amount, like time, but there are things where people are given different amounts, whether it's intellect, resources, education, and whatnot, what you do with that. Now, what about the, the downside? So that's the blessing. It's kind of like the rewards in the New Testament. The downside is the chastisement. The chastisement. So when we sin as believers, we are not cursed, right? Because the curse is done away. The curse was taken by Jesus Christ. So why then, if not reaping and sowing, why, why might somebody come across uh, negative things in their life? You know, maybe you've tried to do everything you can to get this business going, but your business has taken your heart away from the Lord and God needs to get your attention. And somehow he makes it fail. Maybe you get sick. Maybe you can't work it anymore. Maybe a deal goes sour. I don't, whatever, you know. You've tried to keep your health, but it doesn't anyway. Maybe your heart has been getting away from the Lord and he needs to bring it back. So we see here, um, <coughs> let's read from uh, verse... Five, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. So just, just stop at that verse for a moment, because that, that's the key difference. Right, we'll read the rest as well, but just reflect on that verse, that the reason why God chastens you, the reason why God might get your attention in the New Testament, you know, because Jesus Christ has taken the curse away from us, is out of love, isn't it? But what's the curse? The curse is hatred. It's indignation. It's wrath. That's the difference, right? And that makes a huge difference in your spiritual life. If you, if you, if you get corrected on this doctrine, right? Because if you accept the blessing and cursing teaching as it is taught in a lot of Bible-believing churches, you will get to the point where you just think god wants nothing to do with me what can he do with me in fact he's forsaken me I'm, under, I'm cursed you know i'm done with i'm done whereas if you realize no jesus christ took the curse from me i'm a child of god i believe on the lord jesus christ i have the blessing of god hey things might be happening to me either if it's not me that's making it happen by reaping and sowing maybe god is trying to get my attention but he's doing it out of love whom the lord loveth he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth if ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? So he's saying God's not just going to let you be this disobedient son, this disobedient child. He's going to come after you. And like, like, uh, like David said in Psalm 23, his rod and stuff comforts him, right? And the rod represents that chastening. And, and you know, there, there's, there, there's comfort in the fact that, hey, if you're being chastened of God, at least you know he's watching over you. Right? Well, he's not just letting you go and just do whatever. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? Uh, and I won't go on, but uh, it goes on about, uh, you know, obviously spanking being a good thing and, and chastisement bearing fruit and things like that. But that's the major difference. So we have blessing and cursing in the Old Testament. New Testament is rewards and chastisement. 
And they kind of work the same in the sense that, you know, obviously if you don't keep the commandments, there's some negative things that happen to you. And if you keep the commandments, there are positive things that happen to you. The difference is in the Old Testament, it's impossible, right? Because it's all or nothing. But in the New Testament, it's what you put in. Not based on what, you know, because the curse, the sin has been taken away by Jesus Christ. But if you sin on this earth, there is chastisement in order to correct you because God wants more fruit. He wants you to, to build more on that foundation as opposed to building more wood, hay and stubble. And that's the huge difference. Under the law, there's blessings and cursings. Under grace, there are rewards and chastisement. But, you know, it's a blessing to be a servant of God, to be able to earn rewards. It's a blessing to be a son of God, to be able to be chastised by God. Um, and ultimately, believers will be blessed on the new earth, the new heaven and new earth when God creates it again. And that's what Deuteronomy 30 is talking about. So it's so important... I think to have this right understanding of this doctrine so you are not um what's the word sort of hindered i don't know if that's the right word i'm looking sort of like stopped in your spiritual walk and for those of you who might have believed in work salvation in the past where you believed you had to repent of all your sins to be saved keep the commandments to be saved you know how else do they say it? give your life to jesus to be saved now make sure you know once you hear out soul winning like you've got to follow the lord you've got to know him intimately and what they mean by that is that you're keeping all the commandments all these different ways they say this right if you get duped into thinking that for salvation just remember how, how does that make you feel you just think well i'm, I'm never good enough I've never, I've never, I, I don't even know if I've got salvation. How do you think that's going to affect your witness? I remember when I used to go soul winning uh, at a church I used to go to, and I sort of got deceived into this, this thinking of like, you need to turn from your sins. And it really affected my boldness when I was trying to preach the gospel to people. Because I'm trying to tell people, hey, you can know you're saved, you can know you're going to heaven. But there's this nagging thing inside of me that I don't 100% sure I know because I have not turned from all my sins, right? But when you realized that salvation was by grace, you realized that it was all Jesus and it had nothing to do with you, you realized, man, even if I sin and sin and sin, grace will abound, I cannot lose my salvation, I now know I have eternal life. How did that change how you preach the gospel? Now it's not about like, oh, you know, God, God, you know, I used to be this drunken fornicator and God changed my life and that's how I know I'm saved. Now it's like, it has nothing to do with me. It's all Jesus. This is how you can know you're saved. This is the same effect it has when you think that you need to earn God's blessing by works. It hinders how you serve God because you just think that God wants nothing to do with you. God's done with you. And every time you try and do something, you mess up and you're just thinking, oh, again, I've failed, right? Whereas if you realize, hey, you know, God, I'm, I'm under the blessing of God. God loves me. God wants, is trying to support what I'm doing. And when tough times come, I am still loved by God. It will change how you witness. Because like I said, if you, how are you going to share the love and grace of God if you don't believe you even have it yourself? It's the same with salvation. It's the same in the Christian life. And I hope that was a blessing to you. I hope that cleared up a few things. Um, let's pray and then we'll sing a song. All right, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the reminder that you love us. Uh, Lord, we all come short. Um, Lord, even willingly. It's not that we just fall in. It's not that we fall and trip into sin. Lord, daily we, we dive into sin. Um, we, we do things that are not right. We have thoughts that are wrong. Lord, we're selfish. We're lazy. We're materialistic. Um, we have a cold love for people, for the things of you. But Lord, what, what, what love that even though we, are, we come so short of your glory, that Lord, you, you love us as sons, you deal with us and chasten us. Um, Lord, you want us to be fruitful. So I pray, Lord, that you would um, continue to mold us, help us to grow. Uh, Lord, um, we know you're gentle. Um, pray, Lord, that... Um, you know, that we would wise up before um, you know, we undergo too much pain. But pray, Lord, that um, we would all be fruitful and that your love would constrain us and that your love would drive us to, to serve you more, knowing that, Lord, no matter what we do, we have your blessing. Uh, we are not under the curse. Uh, Lord, help us to earn as many rewards as we can in heaven and ultimately bring you the glory that you deserve. Uh, we love you, Lord. We uh, pray in Jesus' name. Amen.